Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Callen. I'm with Callen Construction. And my name is Tim O'Brien with Tim O'Brien Homes. This is what we're going to talk about today or, and discuss. We're going to talk about the building process. We're going to talk about the remodeling mm -hmm. process. We're going to talk about codes. The statewide uniform dwelling code, the code uh, for newer homes in Wisconsin applies across the state. Uh, municipalities may not adopt a more or less stringent code, the UD, and the UDC is enforced by municipal or county building inspectors or the Wisconsin Department of Safety and Buildings. Local remodeling codes we're also going to discuss, and those vary by community as you'll, as you'll see uh, throughout the presentation. We're going to talk about regulations, talk about erosion control and stormwater requirements. We're going to talk about date cap 110, which is the uh, Department of Agricultural uh, Trade and Consumer Protection for the state, uh, commonly referred to as the Ag Department, and uh, talk about safety and safety awareness, uh, talk about OSHA and uh, what OSHA is, uh, fall protection and uh, uh, throughout all of the things that OSHA is doing today. And, and really, just to uh, give you an update on OSHA, the lead, the, what what OSHA is focusing on today are pretty much the leading hazards that cause about 90% of the accidents and injuries. Falls from elevations, floors, platforms, roofs, struck by falling objects, vehicles caught in between, cave-ins, unguarded machinery or equipment, and electrical shock, overhead power lines, power cords, and temporary wiring. to go manual here. Um, so really, we want to really get you guys thinking about, critically about your operations and, you know, looking at what Tom just mentioned, uh, codes and regulations, safety, uh, a lot of that is risk management and, and there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of underlying cost associated with those if you run into a problem with uh, either a code uh, violation or with safety. So really important, we want to make sure that we drive those points home today. Also talk about providing uh, results and experiences for your end customers, your end users, and, and making sure that throughout the process you have a communication flow that hits on the points that are critical to the building phase, not only for your client but for yourself. We're also going to look at talk about change orders, contracts, and uh, sign-offs. So when we look at um, building, just on the building side, and in a moment Tom's going to talk about the remodeling side, we're really looking at kind of two basic facets here and of course I know that there's more uh, than just this and there's hybrids of the two but looking at custom building and production building and kind of the differences when we're looking at custom building you know traditionally and a lot of you guys know this it's on owners lots the owner is typically financing the construction through a construction loan and the builder basically functions as a general contractor whether there's internal labor uh, in the organization or or they go out and hire all the trade contractors to build a house and then you've got the other model, which is production building. And production building is typically on a builder's lot, so the builder already owns the lot. Most of the times it's uh, usually financed by the builder, which is also kind of known as turnkey financing. And then really the builder delivers finished real estate. So we're, you know, in that model, the builder is delivering the finished lot and, and the home. So we're really transferring real estate at that point, where custom building is more just uh, the cl client buying sticks and bricks. And uh, at, uh, as the same with new construction, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the differences between design build remodeling, design and remodeling services, or as a, a general contractor, and then the, the home improvement contractor, the limited uh, services contractor, or the sub trade contractors. So I'm going to take over the building section now. And for just before I go, I want to just take a quick little poll here. How many of you in here are uh, home builders? Okay, how many trade partners do we have in here? And then uh, architects, um, and uh, let's see, what else might I be missing? Is somebody else throw out a, a title that I haven't hit yet? Remodeling contractors. Remodel of course, I'm sorry, duh. Remodeling contractors, engineers, okay, okay. How many remodelers, I'm sorry? Great, good, thank you. So looking at building, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the custom building side of it. 
and, you know, traditionally with custom building, you've got, you've got much more customer involvement. You know, you're dealing with a unique plan in most of those situations. Um, the plans in the home sites belong to the customer, typically, in that program. Um, and usually there's a lot more involved in site, siting the home, uh, maybe working with the existing topography you have there. Uh, obviously, a lot more involvement. The superintendent or, that, or the expediter, as they're also, also referred to, may only visit that site once a week or twice a week, maybe, due to scattered site building. Depends really on your building model and, and, and how you run your organization. A lot of the plan details are finalized before excavation, but there's typically going to be some stuff that's going to linger on as you continue to flush out some of the details, like maybe cabinet layouts um, and other types of uh, jewelry, if you will, that's included with the finished uh, uh, services of the home. But there's also, with this type of process, there's more, option, more opportunity for cost variations and delays. Um, you'll typically may have a client that's going to require, you know, once they see the kitchen laid out and framed up, they may want to move a wall. Um, we just finished building a home for, for a custom client, and there was a lot of, uh, hey, you know, I didn't really think it was going to look this way. I'd like to do it a different way. So there's a lot, tends to be a lot more rework in the process. And then you're dealing more with verbal and written change orders, and I would strongly encourage you to work towards the written change orders. Verbal change orders, uh, unless you're working with a really good client, can get you in trouble sometimes with a he said, she said type thing. So documentation is, is always critical, especially when you're dealing with a, with a high-end custom home or something that's unique and different. But looking at production building, you know, less of customer involvement. They're typically picking from, uh, you know, the builder's portfolio of plans. There's usually a group of standard options, you know, things that are very, these are, these are people that are usually pretty visual people. Um, they need to see it. And limiting the amount of options that they have available to them actually helps them. These are typically your first time, this is their first time build or maybe their second time build. They're definitely not your, your custom client who's typically built more homes in the past. Um, most of the plans, pretty much 95% of it, is, is completed. Plan specifications, colors, material selections are all completed prior to excavation. And that really helps with the, the production building model, which is kind of built on efficiencies of having all of that stuff up front so you could send one bid package out to your vendor trade partners and everybody is locked and loaded and, and ready to go. Superintendent and expediter, typically in a production home building environment, if you're not building in your own exclusive community as a builder, you might be building in a community where you have a multiple group of lots. So you have multiple homes going on at one time. You've got a superintendent that can hit, uh, cover more ground and, and be at that house once if not twice a day. And again, just back to that verbal and written change orders. Um, you know, in, in this case, I don't see any reason really to work with verbal change orders because a lot of it is pretty much done up front. And I really encourage to make sure that even if you agree to something up front, you follow up quickly with a written change order so time doesn't go by and you miss uh, an opportunity to collect on your change. The other part of the process is developer approvals. So if you're usually if you're working in a, in a community or a subdivision that has community covenants and restrictions, there's a very good chance that you're going to have to go before the developer to get your plans approved. Most developers have really nice strict criteria. They give you a list of the things that they're looking for. Obviously, they want the plans. They want the survey. They typically are going to want color selections, and they might even want samples. So make sure that before you go in, you know exactly what's going to be required of you. Uh, developers may require changes to the exterior, uh, not only just the elevation look, like adding gables or a bump out, but even uh, material changes, uh, because they're going to base it on some of the structures that are already in the area and obviously make sure that it meets the, their CC&Rs. Now this process, depending on how busy the developer is or if they have a really uh, finite process like they meet every Tuesday, you know, this could take one to two weeks to go through the process. So just so you know as you have a time frame. So building permits, this is kind of gets into the Uniform Dwelling Code. You'll see that mentioned throughout the slides today and that's also known as the UDC. Uh, building or a permit is required by uh, all state building or by our state building code, so there really isn't many things that you can do without a permit. Um, it's funny; I used to live in Shorewood, and I was replacing my water heater, and I asked the the building inspector if I needed a permit, and he says their rule of thumb is if it costs more than $100, you need a permit. So you know, each municipality is a little different. 
Um, but you know, permits are definitely part of our business. In some cases, there's additional permits, like an elevator. If you guys work with elevators, you have to have an elevator permit. So beyond just the straight house permit, you might find that you need more permits. You're required to submit a full set of prints to the building inspector as well as, well as the survey and the heat loss calcs. This whole process typically takes two weeks. Depends on your municipality. Some municipalities could turn around in three days. Uh, our code require, allows them uh, 10 business days to get done, and most of, the, most of the municipalities will take the full 10. We also have new erosion control and stormwater management requirements, which we're going to go into right now. Um, but that is, uh, that is something that's taken a more front and center position in, in our home building market, as well as development or any type that you uh, disturb the soil. So who must file what they call an NOI? And an NOI is a notice of intent, and that is that you're going to disturb a, a, a geographical area of land, whether it's an acre. In this case, greater than an acre is what they're talking about. Um, so everyone planning to disturb greater than one acre of uh, land surface during the con construction of a commercial building, in this case, under the jurisdiction of the Safety and Building Codes, has to get this permit. Uh, under the UDC permit, when you go in for your permit for your house and uh, one or two family sites, the greater than one acre disturbed requirement serves as the NOI. So when you go in for that permit, that serves as your notice of intent. On the commercial side, it's a little different, but on the residential side, your permit covers that. There's also a great website that you can go to, which uh, actually is on this slide right here, and that's at the... Department of Safety and Public, uh, gosh, they just changed their name. Wisconsin Department of Safety and Professional Services. So you can get that off of their website. So here you can learn more about the erosion control uh, requirements, the new rules, the regulations, um, how to prepare a set of stormwater plans, especially if you're dealing with that commercial environment, um, obtaining the, the permit for the one and two family with the NOI for the commercial buildings. That Again, the NOI for the commercial buildings is that additional step beyond the UDC permit for commercial. And always follow that plan. Make sure that you post all of the requirements that are, that are necessary on the site. Um, you will get inspected, and they could shut you down, at least temporarily, until you correct it or until you fill out the appropriate paperwork. So when we're looking at the Uniform Dwelling Code, it is actually a statewide code. Um, so for one and two family construction, very important to remember because that'll come up later when you guys sit down and take your, your exam. One and two family require a UDC permit. It cannot be changed, the, the code cannot be changed or exceeded by a municipality um, for its, basically for the intended purpose, but you will find when you go into certain municipalities, they may ask you for additional information, but they cannot ask you to exceed what the current code is. So some municipalities, are an easy, quick turnaround permit. Others, there's a lot more documentation that you have to provide, especially if you're dealing with a custom home. There's probably a lot of engineering that they're going to require. And you'll take special note in the remodeling section, and, and Tom's going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, just the UDC references and enforces, it's, it is based off of some other national codes, but again, we are one of the few states left that are, have our own code. Pretty much most everybody has gone to the IRC or the International Residential Code. Um, and also, there's a lot of manufacturer involvement in, in creating these codes. A, a lot of the newer ones, like the wall bracing requirements, I know Simpson Ties was heavily involved. So the state really relies on a lot of manufacturers for recommendations um, in, in terms of their product requirements. So looking at the Uniform Dwelling Code, there's five chapters. It goes chapter 20 through 25. First chapter being that kind of general administrative, you know, general details of who to contact and what you have to do. Chapter 21 gets into uh, construction standards. 22 gets you right into energy conservation, part of your heat loss calcs. And then uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. So um, there's been a few changes there. Does everybody here have a code book or do you know how to access the code? You can also access it online. I think that's very important. If you don't have your own code book, uh, you should get one and carry it with you because we do find at times that people interpret codes differently. Um, so it's important to make sure that you have it there for reference if you're being challenged on something. Electrical standards in 24 and then plumbing standards in, in 25. Right. 
I'm sorry, the chapters change? Did the numbers change when they revised the code? In terms of the, the chapters, which chapters are in? Like 300 something though? Yeah, the DSPS changed it. Okay. Yeah. But it's still in the same type of format, they just reclassified how they... Right, but when you try looking for chapters 20 to 25, I don't know if that... They are there. They're not there anymore. So they start with 300? I, I, I don't even something. know. It's so new. But you could search and find the UDC side of it. Yeah, it's laid out about the same way. It's just that they get okay. the number. Wisconsin.gov or CP okay. buildings. Make sure we get the slide updated. Good to know. Thank you. All right, Tom. Thank you, Tim. Uh, just to talk a little bit about remodeling uh, and uh, some of the models that uh, are, are in that uh, design build remodeling. Uh, again, uh, more daily customer involvement. Uh, and, and when we talk about design build remodeling, I think we're, we're mainly talking about additions, whole house remodels, kitchens, baths, the larger projects. Uh, you know, you may have a project manager or a, a uh, involvement or a lead carpenter uh, running a job. Um, all plans usually are drawn by an architect or a designer. Uh, and really, it's a collaborative process between the customer's vision and the expertise of the architect or the designer. Uh, general contractor is usually actively involved in the job. Uh, the potential for cost variations and delays is, uh, is apparent and, uh, and time delays due to the interaction with customers, although in, in many cases, uh, uh, I think uh, most of us keep to our schedules. And again, verbal or written change orders. Uh, again, I would highly suggest uh, that as far as remodeling goes, that you get written change orders, and, and in many cases, uh, before that work commences, uh, and at least uh, arrange the, uh, the payments, and we'll, we'll get into change orders a little bit later. And then when you get into the home improvement contractor, trade contractor, limited services, really this could be roofing, siding, windows, gutters, leaf protection, drywall, plumbing, electrical, air conditioning contractors. Um, the duration of the project site and the duration of the job is generally uh, shorter than uh, with a design build remodeling uh, model. Uh, customer involvement and, and cost really, in many cases, the homeowner is not home. Where in uh, design builder model, you 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 know usually uh, you're working with a customer who's at home. Uh, certain trade contractors uh, uh, will use an architect on jobs uh, if they are uh, the you know in in essence the general contractor on a job. And and again uh, verbal and written change orders, but again we we always uh, talk about and prefer uh, written change orders. Building permits, uh, this is just, uh, you know, this is just courtesy of the city of Wauwatosa as far as what they require for a permit to, to construct any new building, add to an existing building, alter any living space, and or perform repairs or modifications that involve structural components. An altered space would include projects that create, reconfigure, or modify living space by adding or removing walls. Typical examples would be basement living spaces, kitchens, and baths. And an owner uh, is, uh, well, it's not on here, an owner is, is allowed uh, to pull a building permit. We don't recommend that the uh, owner pull a permit for either a builder or a remodeling contractor. Uh, and uh, just like in uh, new construction, um, submit uh, sets of plans, a site survey, and uh, the, uh, the heat cost, uh, especially when you're getting into the uh, larger design build projects. Any contractor working on a one or two family dwelling must have a valid state certification to pull a permit. And as far as local codes, um, many communities have adopted the UDC for remodeling. However, changes can be made uh, to the code for home improvement and remodeling uh, uh, arenas. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example from the city of West Dallas, uh, when deemed necessary in the opinion of the building inspector, alterations or repairs may be allowed to conform to the code in effect when the building or structure was constructed. And the uh, Uniform Dwelling Code 
uh, goes back, and the reason for that is the Uniform Dwelling Code starts on uh, June 1st, 1980. Just a couple other uh, things on building inspectors. Building inspectors will and can refer and enforce manufacturer specifications. You can find the building code of a municipality, usually in the, uh, as a chapter in their municipal code. And uh, when projects need a building permit as well as a permit, uh, and what, what needs a permit in municipalities can also be, find, can also be found on the uh, municipality's website. Date cap uh, is uh, the Department of uh, Agricultural Trade and Consumer Protection. Uh, they define home improvement, and forgive me for reading, but it's a, it's a rather long definition. Home improvement means the remodeling, altering, repairing, painting, or modernizing of residential or non-commercial property, or the making of additions thereto, and includes but is not limited to the construction, installation, replacement, improvement, or repair of driveways, sidewalks, swimming pools, terraces, patios, landscaping, fences, porches, garages, devices, heating and air conditioning equipment, water softeners, heaters and purifiers, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, or attached or inlaid floor coverings, or other changes, repairs, or improvements made in or on, attached to or forming a part of the residential and non-commercial property, but does not include the construction of a new residence. The term extends to the conversion of existing commercial structures in the residential and non-commercial property. Uh, date cap does not apply to single family home sites or home builders. Date cap 110 also includes sections that uh, prohibit on prohibited trade practices, building permits, and warranties. Uh, and the date cap contract requirements Name and address of seller, a description of the work, the total price, the dates and periods uh, on which the work's going to be done, start and finish date. Attorneys, when, when they, when, if there's ever a, uh, a case where attorneys get involved in a, in a home improvement dispute, the first thing they look at on a contract is to make sure that there's a start and finish date. Uh, if anything that, uh, that, uh, that the state looks at, that's probably the most important aspect of, uh, of the uh, contract requirements for date cap is that start and finish date. A description or identification of any mortgage, um, a statement of any guarantee or warranty with respect to any products, materials, labor, or services, uh, you need to provide a copy of the contract to the customer and the right of cancellation. The penalties, uh, attorney's fees, uh, double pecuniary loss, yes. That start and finish date, does, can that, does that have to be a, a date like June 1st or can it be? It can be a, a uh, it can be a, it can be a variable date. It can be, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. It can be. You know, we, we, on our, most of our agreements, it's uh, six to eight weeks, and then eight to ten weeks are finished. So it doesn't have to be a specific date. And uh, any other questions on that? And the MBA, just uh, for a, uh, uh, the MBA has uh, in their, uh, in all of their remodeling agreements, whether it's a home improvement agreement or a, uh, Remodeling design agreement uh, has the uh, the start and finish dates in there as well. So, the building, the remodeling, uh, the uh, the sales design process. Uh, most product and color selections are taken care of before construction starts. Um, recommend that highly. Uh, document every meeting with the customer and have a method of sign off on decisions. Plan review and changes must be signed off by the customer. And finally, ensure plans that are accurate to the models they represent or to the designs they represent. In that case, uh, 
more from a new construction standpoint than from a remodeling standpoint. Change orders. Um, again, the MBA has a very nice uh, change order form that they make available. Uh, but really, what you want to put uh, on there uh, is the uh, uh, project address, the, uh, the, the, the change to the contract totals, or the change to the sum of the contract, a change of the description of the, uh, the, in other words, make sure that you have a description or the scope of the work, and change of the construction at the, uh, at the time of completion. And then uh, make sure that you get the owner's signature, as well as your signature on it. And uh, preferably, uh, uh, the written change orders uh, come before the work commences. And uh, if unpaid, the contractor has a right to stop work. I, I can, uh, in, the, in the 26 years of, uh, of being in this business, in the remodeling business, I, I, I don't think we've ever had to stop work because a change order wasn't signed. But uh, it, you do have that right. So, Tim? You still got that one? I'll take it. Nope, that's you. Okay. All right, we're going to, Tom and I are going to take team on safety, and I'll start off with um, safety through the process. We're, you, th the things to look at that are very important, uh, and Tom kind of alluded to them early on, but, you know, tool safety, we're going to look at excavation and trench, trenching, masonry work, stairways. You know, you can read the whole list of, of things right here, and a lot of them are related to the things that Tom hit on uh, early on is, is, you know, falling, being struck by, and electrocution. Those are, tend to be the big three ones, the big three that, that OSHA is concerned with, and they pretty much hit on all of the items that are here. So the cost of accidents and, and how does safety pay? <clears throat> well, across the nation, uh, nearly 50 workers are injured every minute uh, of a 40-hour work week. You're looking at 17 workers dying per day where employers have spent more than $1 trillion over in a 10-year on injuries uh, alone. So why do we need to be concerned with safety? Well, some of it is common sense. I mean, it's the right thing to do. You, you hire a bunch of people, you hire your employees, you hire your trade contractors, You've got to ensure a safe site. We want all these people to go home to their families every day, every night, uh, every week, and, and safety is paramount of importance. We want to also control our costs, both our direct costs and our indirect costs. Um, you know, if you've, if you've ever had an OSHA visit to a site, um, it can be very expensive for, for those that are being fined, in addition to all the legal fees and things that you have to go through to uh, defend yourself um, in, in the court of law with OSHA. Safety and health excellence correlates with the business excellence. So you want to prop yourself up as a, as a very professional uh, quality company that, can, that, that trade contractors want to do business and that you're with you and your clients want to do business with you. Safety has to be num or pretty close to being the number one on your agenda in your business. So what does an effective safety and health program do? Um, well, there's really two kind of components to this. One is obviously the safety component, um, the OSHA component, and that's something that all of us here would have some kind of general liability insurance. Your insurance agent should have some guides to help you with your safety program. I know ours did, and, and we put it together. We have toolbox talks. You know, we have uh, make sure that we have the forms, the appropriate forms if there's an accident. We do find people if they're not wearing hard hats. Or, or their safety glasses, or you know the right, uh, the right uh, tool equipment protection. But the other part of it too is is a health program, a health and wellness program, and a lot of that can come from your your uh, medical insurance provider, your health insurance provider. But all of these things are geared to prevent the injuries, to prevent the incident from ever happening, and that's your lowest cost of investment is prevention, both on the health side and the safety side. The other benefits include, you know, ab reduced absenteeism, lower turnover, um, higher productivity, and, impl and improved employee morale. When people know that you care about them, that you're looking out for their best interest to make sure that they get home every day to see their family, there's a lot of benefit that's going to come to you in addition to reduced costs. So, focusing on that effective management to reduce cost, 
again, you know, prevention, an ounce of prevention, um, the, as the saying goes, it's very important. You're going to reduce the uh, employee turnover related costs like we talked about. Um, every dollar spent on accident prevention, four to six dollars are saved in your direct and indirect costs. So, I mean, that's quite a return on your investment, and a lot of people don't really understand that ratio, but one to four or to six is a pretty high uh, ratio. So you want to focus on, uh, you know, with your effective safety and health management, you know, it's going to help you in your ability to compete because you're going to lower your cost uh, in terms of uh, what your insurance costs are, something that Tom's going to go over in a little bit. Enhances your reputation like we talked about early on. You're going to reduce your cost through your insurance cost because you're, you don't have accidents. Over time, your insurance costs will at least not go up <laughs> as much as it, may have, as it has in the past, but you're going to keep control of that. You're improving your quality. You're improving your productivity, your efficiency, your employee morale, and it's going to allow you to gain access to other types of markets that you may not be in right now. So, that's where you pick up, sir. The real cost of accidents, uh, I guess you could say, resemble an iceberg, with the uh, direct cost being the iceberg above the line and the bigger indirect cost being below the line. And, it, it, and you'll see in a second uh, the, uh, the correlation between direct and indirect costs. Direct costs, uh, medical treatment and expenses, doctor visits, physical therapy, medicine, ambulance visits, workers' compensation payouts, replacement of equipment or machinery. Those are the, the direct costs that uh, are related to an accident. But the larger costs involve the indirect costs, the pain and suffering, family stress, morale, emotional disturbances, safety training, OSHA compliance, training and compensating replacement workers, legal fees, civil penalties, time involvement in administrative costs, spoiled product, cleaning time, repair of damaged property, accident investigation, uh, negative publicity, uh, and, and the principal impact of uh, work comp claims. Workers' compensation, uh, the, uh, the experience modifier as far as the, uh, the cost of accidents, something that's not on the slide, but uh, measures the work comp claims of a company. The average rate is tailored to a credit or debit of the experience rating modifier in proportion to how much better or worse your experience Excuse me. The average rate is tailored to a creditor to debit of the experience rating modifier in proportion to how much better or worse you experience in the average of employers engaged in businesses like yours. One of the most important characteristics of your experience rating is that it recognizes that the cost of a specific accident is actually less meaningful than the fact that an accident actually occurred. An employer having many small accidents is considered a higher risk than an employer with one higher claim. The bottom line is good loss experience is rewarded with lower than statewide premiums. Poor loss ratio is penalized by paying higher premiums. So you can see the indirect costs as far as, as the name are much more expensive than your direct costs. The ratio of uh, these next slides, these next four or five or six slides, show the cost of accidents relative to indirect and direct costs. You can find that the ratio of, of indirect is somewhere anywhere from 4.5 times. That's been updated. That can go as high as 10 times the cost. In other words, a direct cost of an accident is $3,000. The indirect cost can be anywhere from 13500 up to 30000 so the, the costs of an accident multiply from the direct costs to the indirect costs.
The more accidents in a facility, the higher the insurance premiums. We explained that. The higher the premiums, the lower the profit on each product sold. And how accidents affect your bottom line. In other words, if your net profit margin is 3% and the accident cost is $25,000, it would take an additional $825,000 in sales to make up for that lost profit by one accident. So that, that $25,000 cost relates out to $825,000 in sales. So you'll see throughout this, the rest of this presentation, the emphasis on safety uh, throughout every aspect of the uh, remodeling and or building process. These are just some of the accident costs and the impact on sales. You can, uh, I'm not going to read all through this, but uh, you can, uh, just to give you an idea, you can see some of the costs, the highest cost of an accident uh, uh, up there is, uh, I think, 21,000. I just got some new uh, figures from OSHA uh, in one of their newest presentations. Falls from elevations by roofers cost about 100, average cost is about $106,000 each. Falls by carpenters from elevations, about $97,000 each. The average cost of a fall from elevations for all other occupations is less than 50,000. Falls from ladders or scaffolds by roofers, about $68,000 cost. And falls by carpenters from ladders and scaffolds, about average about 62,000. So you can see that, that some of these costs may be correct, but you know, the, the cost, at least for roofers and carpenters, can go much higher. This just gives you an idea of the, uh, the direct cost, the indirect cost, and the total cost of an accident. But you can see from some of the numbers that OSHA's, these totals can go much higher. And, and just to, uh, you know, Tim uh, touched on the, uh, on the OSHA fines at the beginning of our uh, conversation. You know, I, I just took one SIC code off of the uh, OSHA website for uh, roofing, siding, and sheet metal. Uh, the, the total number of fines, the, the, the total dollar amount of fines for that SIC classification is over $13 million. So it, it by far and away, uh, the highest uh, SIC code from a violation standpoint. This just uh, gives you an idea on how to estimate. You can take your direct costs and multiply it at, uh, you know, it says 4.5 times. You can estimate, that can go as high as 10 times your direct costs. something new. Huh. Just gives you an example of uh, direct, indirect, and total cost for that uh, one accident. And the impact on sales. And this is just the uh, sales impact on uh, selected injury, sprains, lacerations, foreign bodies. And the sales needed, uh, you know, at a 5% net profit. All the way up to $220,000 uh, in sales to make up for that one uh, ankle sprain or arm sprain or... Uh, Tom alluded to um, you know the OSHA site, and if you haven't been on it yet, there's a there's a great resource there for you. Um, one of these is this the Safety Pays worksheet, which Tom touched on, and which some of the uh, bullet points were taken from in, the, in that presentation. And uh, so you can you can go on uh, the OSHA website and get a lot of information, including 
uh, videos uh, on safety, stuff that you could share with your team um, and your trade contractors. And again, encouraging you to, to reach out to your insurance, your general casualty liability insurance uh, entity. They, they typically will have a very nice structured safety program for you so you don't have to reinvent uh, the wheel here. But the OSHA site is a great tool uh, to go on. So one of the things that we look at or that OSHA looks at is defining multi-employer work sites and kind of what is the definition of that. Well, the quick definition is, is typically it's more than one employer, well, actually, I'm sorry, I'm a slide ahead of myself. More than one employer can be citable for a hazardous condition that violates an OSHA standard. So if you're on site with your crew, say, and you've got somebody else that's uh, violating one of the OSHA standards, you, in essence, could be drawn into that as well. Um, determining if it's more than one employer will be cited for a violation, the first step is determine whether that employer is creating or exposing, correcting, uh, or controlling employer. So is that employer, you know, the creating, exposing, correcting, or controlling employer? Step number two is if that employer's actions were sufficient to meet the required obligations. That would put you into the multi-employer worksite. So the creating employer, by definition, is one that causes a hazardous, hazardous condition. The exposing employer is the one whose employees are exposed to said condition. Then that correcting employer is the one that's responsible for correcting that hazard, whatever it may be, that is the correcting employer's responsibility. The controlling employer is one who has a supervisory authority over the work site, so your superintendents, project managers, those type of people. So an employee can meet the definition, or employer, excuse me, can meet the definition of more than just those categories. So that's, a, we'll take a little break from safety and kind of go into the building process now. Um, this is kind of a building 101, if you will, for a lot of you. Um, but we're going to start with basically looking at the first step, and that is the stakeout and the excavation. And of course, as we go through all of these, the UDC has code sections related to each one of these topics as we go through, so they'll all be covered. Um, that survey is really the initial piece that really defines that boundaries of the, of the house, how it fits on the site, where it's positioned on the site, ensuring that it meets the setbacks and other requirements of not only the community that it's being built in, but also the, the state code. Then you have the stakeout, which is that physical definition, where the surveyor actually goes out puts the stakes in the grounds and gives you that physical definition of where the holes to be dug. Typically this will take two weeks. It's all a function of how much information your surveyor can get um, from the municipality and then you're ready to excavate. So here's just an example of a finished survey. Um, this is one of ours. Um, we identify you know, where our silt fence is going on the property. Um, I remember in the past where you just had to focus on where water drains to. Pretty much now you're wrapping the entire site except for the driveway. One of the things that we do is we also go through and check our grades. We check off on the grade. We check off on the top of foundation just to make sure it makes sense for the site. We have found instances where uh, it's best to adjust the top of foundation, and we work with the municipality, of course, to do that. Uh, make sure that you do that if you do play with that. We identify other things on there, too, in addition to you know, the main proposed building pad, the garage, and such. This just happens to be an alley load condition that we have. Focusing on safety, you know, in excavation, um, it is one of the most hazardous, you know, being buried in a, in a trench, sewer and water trenches are, are typically the ones that you hear the most of. Most accidents occur in trenches that are only 5 to 15 feet deep, so they really don't have to be that deep. Um, and there's usually no warning before a cave-in, it, it just lets loose. Um, and your soil conditions are all going to be determinate upon how much space you're going to have to leave uh, in your excavation, but obviously this isn't satisfactory. So issues around excavation, um, here's a, an OSHA interpretation. This is pretty old, 1996. I won't read everything, but I'm going to focus on the big interpretations here. Starting up here, they're looking at basically the requirements for fall protection around a residential basement foundation and excavation that's deeper than six feet. So now I'm going to read this section verbatim. Please be advised that paragraph 501B7 requires fall protection around excavations only when the excavations are not readily seen 
because of plant growth or other visual barriers. Now I'm going to stop here. So if you dig a hole and you've got it open and it's for the weekend and you have some kids possibly in the neighborhood, if they can't see it and run into it, that's something that they might uh, come after you for. The typical house foundation is not obscured from view and therefore OSHA does not require a fall protection if you don't have that requirement for employees working near such excavations. So there's a lot of this examples that you can find on the OSHA site. Here's another one that talks about benching your cuts. So whenever you're digging a foundation, you know, you've got no less than two feet at the bottom. You're going to step up, go across another two feet, and step up and go across another two feet at five foot increments and then seven and a half off the bottom. That's called either stepped uh, excavation or in this case, uh, a bench cut excavation. And, that, and the other important thing to do is if your soils are very saturated, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of horizontal pressure on that soil. So if you're working in a condition where you've got some moisture coming out of these, these bench cuts, you might have a, a, a little subsidence that could potentially go on there. So you might want to step that back even further. But what's important is not only to make sure that there's space for people to work in here, but if we do have some horizontal pressure going through, we have it at least stepped down that we can kind of capture some of that. Um, and, and again, these are the requirements for, for excavation. Excavation standard shall not be applied to a house or foundation basement excavations when all of the following conditions are present. There's no heavy uh, equipment operating in the vicinity. A lot of the times when you have a backhoe or if you have trucks or every, any other heavy trucks that are running around the excavation area, that vibration will cause soil to move. So it's very important to make sure that you don't have heavy equipment uh, in that area. All soil equipment, material surcharge loads are no closer in distance to the top edge of the excavation than the excavation is deep. So it's kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. You should be one foot out for every foot down you are. However, when front end loaders are used to dig the excavation, the soil surcharge load shall be placed as far back from the edge as excavation as possible, but never closer than two feet. So you really don't want that backhoe right on top of, of the cut. Work crews in the excavation are the, are, should be the only the minimum number needed to perform the work. We really don't want to be loading up that excavation pit with a lot of people. Typically, there's one person in there holding the uh, survey stake so we can make sure that we're digging uh, to the appropriate cut. In other conditions, this is just continued where uh, the excavation standard shall not apply is when the work has been planned and carried out to matter to minimize, and that's kind of subjective, the time employers are in the excavation. This policy applies to such house foundation basement excavations, including those which become trenches by definition when formwork foundations or walls are constructed. The policy does not apply to utility excavation trenches where it falls under that particular section in the code. So now we're going to hit in some pictures. This is really tight. Um, you know, maybe it's enough to have a person work around that, uh, that foundation wall to set a form, to strip a form, but there is not a lot of area to move if you get some subsidence in that soil or if that soil decides to shift a little bit. There is no movement at all for any person that's sitting in that hole. So looking at uh, the foundation, getting back to that construction component of it, footings, code required 8 inches by 16 inches, is your minimum pad, uh, footing pad uh, by the length of the wall. Then your foundation wall is your vertical component that sits on top of that. You have a perimeter drain tile system. There's a, two major ways that you can do this. We'll show, it, show you in a bit. Um, but all of that is to carry groundwater around the perimeter of the foundation and then get to a sump crock so we can get it out and away from the house. The more water we have in that soil that's against that foundation, the more hydrostatic pressure we have pushing against that wall kind of causing cracks and, in some cases, even premature failure. Typically, uh, the foundation and backfill is about two to three weeks. Um, starts with the footing and drain tile preparation. Walls are typically poured the next day. And then you got about a seven-day cure time. Maybe in the winter time, you might be closer to 10 days uh, just because of the, the colder temperatures. Drain tile system's complete. You insulate the warm walls um, if, if your scope calls for that, and obviously if your heat caulks call for that. Backfill inspection by the municipality and then your backfill itself. So there's different site conditions um, identified as, as type 1 and, and type 2. Type 1 related more to 
subsurface or, or latent physical conditions which differ materially from what those are in your contract documents. Now this is something obviously that you can't see unless you have a soils engineer go out there and do a test or unless you dig a bunch of holes yourself. The subsurface um, items are a variable for you and your client. Type 2 is unknown physical conditions encountered of unusual nature. Differ material from what's recognized in the construction activities of, of character or provided for the contract documents. Some of that might be related to uh, bedrock or things that you might have to blast. So has everybody, Tom alluded to this a little earlier about the change orders, everybody know that the MBA has contracts online that you can use, change orders, scopes of work. Um, there's a great resource for you online. One of the sections in the, in the MBA's contract talks about the, these site conditions. And, and basically what it says using this, and I won't read this through this verbatim, but there are certain things that we as builders, we, we don't know. And that basically is what's underneath the surface. If we hit some bad soils or you hit a layer of topsoil that you have to punch down deeper, or if you hit the bedrock that you have to, that you have to blow, or the water pumping, there's a lot of different pieces that fall into this category. There's an allowance mechanism. Basically, it's kind of a cost plus. And you agree with your client up front what that markup is going to be. Um, then you have to document everything if you're going to present that to them. So if you've got an engineering cost, say 500 or 800 bucks, you're going to supply that invoice to your client as backup for the additional work that you had to do in addition to the man hours and time that you got into additional excavation or blasting or whatever it may be, you're required to document that and back that up to justify your request for additional monies. So here's kind of a typical footing setup. Um, I have a better photo here that kind of shows you bleeder tile. Uh, I'm not sure how many people still use the traditional uh, round drain tile. There are nice uh, more cost-effective methods nowadays, but we still have a bleeder tile that runs through between the foundation footing to make sure that moisture inside and outside can move back between the drain tiles, which are on both sides of the footing, which is what you kind of see here. Now, this is a product called Forma Drain. It's been around for, gosh, uh, 10, 15 years, probably 15 years by now. This is very easy to use. Um, I like it because it's, it's very efficient, saves on labor. I also like the fact that it's got different elevations of slots. So if we do get some areas within the tile that get plugged, this has got a much more greater capacity to flow water and help in those situations where you may have a very sandy soil or very silty soil. And that product is called Formadrain. You can also get it with a uh, mesh on it to, uh, for sandy soil so you can minimize the amount of material that flow in, <coughs> flows into the drain tile. So uh, safety component, masonry work, um, both you know, cement and concrete work. There's a lot of silica exposure whenever you cut concrete uh, or whenever you cut block. So making sure that you know, you're, you're either in a well-ventilated area or preferably have some kind of respiratory uh, device on, um, even in cases of loud machinery, you know, having some earplugs, have, definitely having uh, some safety glasses on. It's going to be very important for you to make sure that you protect your, your employees. An example here of a, of a block wall foundation. Here's a poured wall foundation. Um, kind of hard to see in the picture, but the cut isn't that deep. They did step back a little bit, but for the most part, you know, make sure that you've got access around that foundation. Here's one uh, picture showing uh, a drain, drainage board that's also an insulation board and then all of our stone that's over our drain tile to make sure that we don't have the migration of the soil into the drain tile. Here's a nice workable area for someone to get around. You know, it's, we're definitely within that uh, criteria that we showed you early. Uh, just by the nature of this particular dig, we've already got kind of a lower level area here. We don't have to worry too much about soil subsidence in this case. So framing stage, um, looking at floor framing, you know, there's a number of different ways that you could approach it. You could approach it with the traditional 2x12 on edge or 2x10s, or you can go with the engineered eye joists. Um, we tend to stick uh, in our organization with the eye joists. We just find more dimensional stability with that product. 
Subfloor you're looking at is basically your structural floor, your decking, tongue and groove. Typically it's a three quarter inch OSB or plywood and whether you nail it or screw it to the joist is your choice. Uh, typically you're going to have a layer of glue that's in there too to kind of help seat it throughout the, uh, throughout the floor system. So wall flaming, fr flaming, wall framing, we have studs, we have our, whether it's two by six or two by fours, you know, your traditional plates on the top and the bottom of your walls, your headers, which are your horizontal bridges over your openings, so your windows, your doors, you have two different types of headers, you have load bearing and you have non-load bearing, same thing with your walls. So a load bearing wall, you know, pretty much every exterior wall of your house is going to be a load bearing wall and traditionally you're going to have one in the middle somewhere that picks up the different spans going from front to back or side to side. Not a general rule of thumb, especially for remodeling, and I'm sure a number of you have got stories about that. I always want to make sure you really understand where those load bearing and non load bearing walls are before you start breaking stuff out for uh, making more space for people. Sheathing is your exterior skin of the home. That can be whether that's a foam board or OSB. Uh, there's other products out there I'm sure you can use. But all of that basically is the skeleton of your home. And it's important to make sure that you understand how each one of those components work. So roof framing, um, there's really two types of roof framing. Trusses are the, pro the predominantly used product nowadays. I, I really don't see a lot of conventional rafter framing. That's the old method of doing it, except for some unique gables or some custom pieces on a house, or I'm sure in the remodeling business, you know, it's probably even more cost effective to do rafters than it, it would be with roof trusses. And then your decking is typically a half inch of, of OSB uh, on the roof. So here's kind of an example. This is the looking up at a floor deck system. You know, here you can see our eye joists. Uh, eye joists come in different uh, types of, each manufacturer has a different way of doing it. I believe this is a laminated veneer here. Sometimes this is solid timber but it always has that OSB look web to it. Again, I like these because you do get more dimensional stability. You don't get a lot of movement with the product. I mean, it still is wood at the end of the day, but it's not coming directly out of one tree. It's made up of a lot of different trees, and you, from that you get a little bit more dimensional stability. And here's just an example of, of roof trusses. Um, much more efficient use of lumber. Typically it's going to be 2 by 4 product. Sometimes it'll be 2 by 6s It depends on the type of span condition you're dealing with. Always using these gusset plates here to connect the lumber. That's really your connection. There's not a lot of nails in trusses at this point, but a lot of connections and all engineered, which is, which is great. So you have the engineering to back up what you're building without having to go and hire an engineer to calc it for you. Fall protection in residential construction. Uh, just a uh, couple things before I begin. Uh, I will tell you again, uh, I can't recommend uh, enough the, uh, the OSHA website. Uh, they do have um, uh, sample fall protection plans on that site uh, and uh, highly recommend that everybody, if you don't have it already, but uh, that you uh, uh, put together a fall protection plan for your company. Uh, OSHA also on their website uh, has a very uh, convenient uh, pocket guide for worker safety series uh, on construction. Again, something that uh, I, would, uh, I would highly recommend you, uh, you go to their site and get. But uh, just in the uh, workers engaged in residential construction six feet or more above lower levels must be protected by conventional fall protection or alternative fall protection measures under 1926-501, of which is a, an OSHA code number for particular types of work. Um, I will tell you that if an employer can uh, demonstrate that fall protection is uh, uh, required under the, uh, under the code, uh, is infeasible or presents a greater hazard if implemented must implement a written spite specific plan according to the requirements of uh, 25 CFR 1902. Just to give you an idea, on this 1926-502, there's 10 subconditions to make a change to OSHA's rules. You can go through the 10 if you want. You can look it up. It's, uh, it's pretty extensive. So 
So, you know, just to give you an example of, of three of those, uh, fall protection plant shall be prepared by a qualified person or developed specifically for the site where the leaning edge work, precast concrete work, or residential construction work is being performed and the plan must be maintained on site. Any changes to the fall protection plan shall be approved by a qualified person. And a copy of the fall protection plan with all the approval changes shall be maintained at the job site. That's just the first three of, that, of those 10 subconditions. Focus on safety, uh, just, to, just to kind of reiterate going all the way back to the beginning, that the reason for a safety policy is to send every worker home safely at the end of the day. Really when we, when we go through all of these safety requirements for the various aspects of the building or remodeling process, that's the goal. Um, and Tim talked about uh, creating employers uh, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, and then getting to the stairways, uh, permanent or temporary guardrails must be installed before stairs are used for general access between levels to prevent falling or stepping off edges. You can see that in the picture. Floor and wall openings, uh, install guardrails. Uh, around openings and floors and across openings and walls when the fall distance is six feet or more. Assure the top rails can withstand a 200 pound load. Construct guardrails with the top rail approximately 42 inches high with the mid rail that high at, 20, uh, at 21 inches. If installed with a, with a tow board, uh, guardrail systems can also protect workers on lower levels from falling objects. Do not remove guardrails to accommodate trades. Trades, uh, And when employers are using stilts, the top edge height of the top rail or equivalent member shall be increased by the height of the stilt. So for your drywall contractors, that top rail needs to be increased by the height of the stilt. Again, an example of the uh, floor and wall openings. 42 inch high rail, 21 inch mid rail, uh, and the uh, tow board down at the bottom for the falling objects. Aerial lifts, um, fall protection is required on articulating lifts. Again, you can see the guardrails. Not recommended to use forklifts, obviously from the picture. Lit, uh, uh, without any guardrails, sitting most likely on a pallet, not recommended. And for forklifts, you must have a manufacturer authorization uh, before uh, doing anything uh, for an application or for any type of actual uh, application using a forklift. Baskets uh, must meet standards of, uh, of the American Society of uh, Mechanical Engineers and the American National Standards Institute. I must admit I looked for probably 15 minutes to find that uh, um, standard and uh, could not on either website. So, uh, but I can tell you that uh, for the uh, baskets, you need a 42-inch guardrail, 4-inch tow boards, a slip-resistant floor, and a basket width not greater than 10 feet on either side of tires uh, for moving parts to the head that pose a hazard. Securely attach a platform to the lift and a data plate indicating empty weight. Uh, make sure that you are aware of this and a maximum working load capacity before you use the basket.
conventional flaw protection systems, guardrail systems, safety nets, and uh, PFAs, personal fall arrest systems. Uh, again, just to, um, OSHA has a very nice document, uh, Fall Protection and Residential Construction, uh, an OSHA guidance document. Uh, again, it's available on their website. It goes through all of what we're going to cover uh, over the next couple minutes. I'm just going to talk a little bit about guardrail systems. Brackets for engineered guardrail systems can either be side mounted or deck mounted. Either way, employers should look to the manufacturer instructions or the recommendations of a registered professional engineer for proper installation. Here we go. And guardrails at, at the edge or at rake boards during roofing activities are recommended. Uh, guardrails, PFAs, or safety nets, uh, you know, for those activities should be used as well. Again, the bracket systems, protecting the roofer on the right, and a, another bracket uh, system on the left. Safety net systems, these nets have been positioned to present falls to the interior of the building. Employers should consult the manufacturer instructions again or a registered engineer uh, for proper installation. Give due, to, uh, uh, due, give, uh, due consideration when using a net uh, to the potential impact load and lateral load of the stud walls uh, in the event of a fall. Personal fall arrest systems, uh, full body harnesses. For roofing work, sheathing work, flooring work. And uh, just to talk a little bit about anchor points. Uh, and uh, these are just some of the things that uh, off of the, uh, the OSHA website. Employees installing ridge poles or rafters can use strap anchors or bolt on anchors. These anchors can be used with the PFAs and fall restraint to provide fall protection for workers engaged in this activity. Both anchors can be removed and reused according to manufacturer specifications. Anchors and retractable lifeline stands can be reused by workers installing roof sheathing Permanent anchors can be installed during roofing operations and left in place um, uh, after construction is complete. They provide an anchorage point uh, during the life of the roof. I, I didn't see a, a question. Okay. Uh, reusable anchors can also be used uh, while weatherproofing a roof. It uh, is important to inspect these anchors prior to use. Make sure that uh, you, know, you instruct your employees in the proper wearing of uh, personal uh, fall arrest systems. Good example on the right, bad example on the left. Other work methods, a bracket system. With a uh, with a guardrail, scaffold system with a guardrail. Excuse me. Pump jack scaffold again with a guardrail.
Again, in the, uh, an all-terrain uh, forklift uh, with a basket attachment, again with guardrails. Uh, the boom aerial lift, uh, again with, uh, with guardrails, tow boards. And uh, in, in, in getting to, uh, and, and this basically says that uh, what you can assemble on the ground and, uh, and uh, lift up is, uh, is, is a good method of uh, protecting against falls. Worker on a top plate has to give leverage with a large truss. I can tell you that uh, uh, OSHA uh, has fact sheet, the reducing falls during residential construction when installing roof trusses. And uh, just to uh, how to reduce risks, of course, one of the things that starts with is ground assembly, using lifts, scaffolds, ladders, platform and step ladders, and uh, using an engineered spreader. And uh, just goes on to say that although personal fall arrest systems are the most widely used form of fall protection in residential construction, they might not be suitable when workers begin installing roof truss sections because they're may not be a stable place to attach an anchor. And again, you can, uh, the, the OSHA fact sheet uh, uh, for trusses, you can uh, again go to the OSHA website and uh, get that uh, and it's readily available. That's exactly what we just talked about. Trusses are not designed to resist lateral impact loads associated with falls. Could cause all trusses in the system to collapse in a domino effect in that uh, fact sheet uh, is uh, what we just went over. An example of a spreader on the left. Here it's called a truss spanner. OSHA refers to it as a spreader. Other uh, methods of fall protection, uh, controlled access uh, zones and control lines, covers uh, can be used to prevent workers from falling through holes, uh, mobile scaffolds with uh, guardrails, barricades, fences and covers can be used to prevent workers from falling into excavations. So now we're going to get into uh, weatherization. This will be our last section before um, our break at around 2.30. Uh, so when we're looking at weatherization, we're looking at roofing and exterior cladding. Um, and, and again, in the UDC chapters, roofing is basically a durable weather-resistant material covering that structural roof sheathing in a layered fashion. And you're going to, you're going to see us talk more about that when we get into weather-resistant barriers to keep that bulk water out of the, out of the roof system. So your typical types of roofing materials would be, you know, your traditional composites, fiberglass, asphalt, but obviously there's a lot more. Cedar shakes, slate, um, and there's even uh, green roofs. Uh, there's a lot of different roofing things that you could do nowadays. So when we're looking at our weather-resistant barrier, it's very important to remember that shingle staggered effect that we're looking for. Um, here, 
We've, it's kind of a tough picture to see, but we've got step flashing uh, covering uh, right up against the, in this case, the Tyvek barrier. We want to make sure that this weather resistant barrier, in this case Tyvek, is actually pulled up and tacked while the roofer puts in his, his baby tins or his tin flashing. When our siders come back, then they bring that down and that way we ensure that we've got this drainage plane that doesn't allow water to get behind the building. That's probably one of the most overlooked uh, pieces is, uh, and you'll, I'll show you a better picture later, but the analogy is, is you wouldn't go out into the rain with your raincoat tucked into your underwear. So why would we tuck our weather resistant barrier behind our flashing? That's pretty a great, good analogy uh, to use. So when you're thinking about that and you're looking at a detail, always remember don't tuck your raincoat into your underwear. So here's another example where you can kind of see that the Tyvex left up. In this case, our roof flashing is underneath. Uh, ideally, this should be taped or caulked, that is the flashing to the sheathing, and then the Tyvek comes over the top of that. That makes sure that we've get, even if we get some water behind the Tyvek, say behind the window for whatever reason, or there's a tear in the Tyvek, in that case, if it does get behind the Tyvek, at least the caulked baby tins in this case will allow it to come out from the underside and get back out under a roof section. Here's a, another example of a, a contractor using a, a tape over the baby tins up against foam. Um, I'm a big proponent of the weather resistant barrier. This was before uh, that came into the code. But just, you know, it's hard to get kind of a tape to stick to a foam in general. Um, Linda's going to talk about some other details as, with, as it relates to weather resistant material or barriers and, and flashing. But I think it's important, it's a critical that you do tape or caulk that step flashing to your sheathing. Here's an example of what they call a, a kickout flashing. Um, not the best example of a roof where you're going to get a lot of water screaming down the side, but the goal here is to have, as the water's coming down that side of the roof, before it hits your gutter, not to have it go past your gutter, but to kick into your gutter. Um, I'll go back one, two slides here and show you a better picture of that. So as we've got the water rolling down our roof here along this flashing, we want to make sure that it doesn't overstep our gutter and it gets kicked back into the gutter or might even in some cases go behind the siding. Having that little roof diverter up at the top there ensures that when that water does run behind here we can kick it back out into what eventually will be a gutter in this location. So that's called kick out flashing. Drainage plane systems designed to shed bulk water while allowing uh, for basically moisture management, i.e. not having moisture behind your wall system or behind your drainage plane. The system basically starts at the roof. Starts at the roof and runs all the way down into the foundation system. You've got to keep making sure that you lap over the top so you've got that continuous drainage plane all the way down. So the typical systems you look at, you know, composites like, uh, like a Tyvek product, felt paper, completely sealed exterior wall system, and that is what we refer to as our weather resistant barrier or our WRB. Flashing systems for windows and doors, any opening, any perforated opening, not only just windows and doors, but, you know, gas lines, water lines, anything that penetrates that wall system or that box sill. You somehow have to make sure that you don't have any water that migrates back into the framing system at those penetrations. So, Here's some pictures. Um, at a time when we were all using Tyvek for air barriers, um, here's an example where if we, this is a chimney chase, and if we did get moisture back behind the siding in this chase, it's going to dive right down back behind this, this Tyvek paper here. So it's important to make sure that even if it's in unconditioned space, like a garage or a gable end, that you run that weather resistant barrier all the way up to the top and then, and then lap it over the top of this one so when we do have moisture that does get behind our siding or behind our exterior cladding it could continue its journey down and out. Another thing I just want to show here because I have the opportunity to do so it might be a little hard to see. Ideally when you have a roof coming down into a chimney you want to extend kind of a cricket or a little gable if you will behind here at least 9 to 12 inches past this corner. 
So when water is driving down the roof section here, it's going to hit the valley flashing and push it past here. We don't want water ramming up against that, that intersection where we have the, sh uh, the, the chase, in this case, going up, against, going up through the roof. It's important to kick that water out as far as you can and as quick as you can. Here's an example of with vinyl siding and no weather resistant barrier. Um, not even at the time, not even taped uh, joints in, in the dowel board is what's shown here. So critical because we're going to read about, we're going to see this later. Vinyl siding isn't a weather resistant barrier. It's a, and it's an aesthetic piece. It's a, it's a, your exterior cladding, but it's designed to move because of it. It does expand and contract quite a bit. Therefore, it hangs on the house. You have to make sure that your house is 99.9% .9 watertight before you put a product like vinyl siding on the house. So important. If you ever look after a rainstorm, you pull pack uh, some vinyl siding, especially on the side where it rained, I guarantee you, you'll find moisture. Another example of kind of what we talked about here, they decided, you know, again, back in the time when it was all just an air barrier, nobody did the chimney chase. So now we've got possible penetration points on this corner on this corner, and here's a great example of that gable I was telling you about. Especially with vinyl siding, you know, the, the more moisture that you're going to get behind the vinyl siding area is not directly in plane, but it's whenever you have these angles. And then when water beats against this in a wind-driven rain, it just dives right behind that siding. And as it continues down, it's going to get into what you may be able to see here is a very large opening where the gable sits on the top plate, in addition to the fact that it's going to dive uh, behind that Tyvek in this case. So very important to make sure that you focus on wrapping everything on your house. Another example of a bad detail. Linda's going to talk a little bit about this later. Arch window tops, very hard to flash. Um, Tyvek has a great flexible uh, wrap product that you could put over the top of that, but that's not going to do you any good if you leave all of these holes up above. Again, back, this is a gable end condition. This Tyvek should run all the way up to the top of the gable end underneath, and ideally even over the gable before the roof sheathing goes on. Here's a picture of just a, a, a flashed window uh, using a, a tape product, leaving the bottom open just in case any water does get in below into this window frame. It can shed behind here. In this case, the Tyvek goes back into the house over the over the rough sill plate. We've got some flashing at top. We're going to talk a little bit more about flashing in a bit. Uh, here's an example of uh, a Tyvek detail. Uh, we use flex wrap. This is one of our windows. We use flex wraps in all of our corners here and then a what they call a straight flash across the bottom and then we flex wrap up on the top too. Our window then sets on top of that. And this ensures that if we do get any moisture penetration in the window, say, you know, a window in 10 or 15 years from now gets a small little crack in the, weeps, in the weep system, we want to be able to get that water out. It might be just a small amount, but we want to be able to get that water out. And that's one of the reasons why we really focus on this section, the sill, and that up, up return. The window sits on top. We nail it, but we don't caulk the bottom flange so that water can get out. But everything else on the window is taped all the way up to the top and even the top section. Again, raincoat tucked into the underwear. Here, the tape flashing for the, for the baby tins and for the roof flashing, it went right over the top of, of the building paper. So any opportunity, like up here we have a tear. And again, that's on that gable end, so we've got that water driving into that corner if this is a vinyl sided house is going to drop back behind our weather resistant barrier, our first layer of protection, actually our second layer of protection, but we don't have a redundant system to get it out. We've just buried it back in the house. So hopefully it shows up in the house and the client sees it so you can address it immediately, but typically it does not. And it festers there for years and years until some big blowout. So it's very important to make sure that you've got that detail down. Um, you know, with that, I think probably we're in the proper stage here to take a break. We're about 2.26 right now. Uh, we'll take a 15-minute break, a little bit stronger than 15 minutes. Come back at uh, quarter to three. Okay, and we'll start right away with Miss Linda.